if you win four days out of seven, you win the week. If you win, I forget what it is. If you win like three weeks out of four of the month, you win the month. And if you win eight months out of the 12, you win the year. So you don't have to win every day. You have to win like just like a little bit more than 50% of the week. Welcome back to The S Factor. My name is Steve Bazogany. I'm a former real estate agent and a who now runs a uh, gift giving company. Uh, my success factor is consistency. Good morning, Steve. Welcome to The S Factor. How are you today? Great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. We are excited to have you here as well. Uh, this is, will be a very interesting conversation. We're going to talk about real estate. We're going to talk about productivity. And we're going to talk about a lot of different other things as well. So um, let's get started with real estate, actually. So you've been involved with real estate since 2012. That's when you started flipping houses and you then went on to become a realtor, right? So tell us about that journey. Uh, it was a fun one. Um, I started out as an accounting major in college and I did a couple of internships and realized that I absolutely hated them. Um, so what I didn't want to do was, um, I'm, I, I am a numbers guy, but I, I'm not a numbers guy, uh, nine to five for 30 years. <laughs> so I basically, what I had to do, um, what, and it was junior year when I discovered this. So it was like, uh, I'm like, I got one year left and I don't want to do what I'm been studying for the last three years. So what do I, what can I do to get to, I need to find a job that offers opportunity, a good opportunity that doesn't require a whole lot of skills, uh, to get into which real estate did not have a high barrier of entry. You basically just go get your real estate license and that was it. And then you just off to the races you go. So, uh, then I, that's when the real fun started when you have to really learn how to do sales and, and, and negotiate and, and be good with people and all the other things that I was not trained to do, uh, formally. So that's basically where uh, the whole real estate journey went. But when I was in college still, I spent my senior year basically not present. I'm not present mentally in, in college. I spent all of senior year looking at houses, looking at real estate, flipping houses. Um, and then by the end of senior year, I was like, yep, we're doing real estate. So I never actually set foot in an accounting office doing accounting work. Um, it, I did this house flipping, the house flipping right out of college and, and went on with that. But I actually started really losing money and actually stopped making money entirely because I, I couldn't manage the contractors properly. And it wasn't something I really even loved doing. Uh, it was just too much work for, for, you know, for me at, at that age, I just didn't want to do it. And I it couldn't, it, it wasn't producing enough money fast enough, uh, for what I needed to do. I mean, the average project was like six to 12 months and then. And you, and they could very well, you know, based on how well you manage the contractors, you could lose money at the end of that time. So like, it wasn't going to put food on the table immediately, which is what I needed, which was like, how do I sell homes quicker? So I got my real estate license and that's where the uh, things really started taking off because you could sell, you could get a home listed, sell it and be done with it in 30 to 60 days, which that would work. That works out. <laughs> uh, so that's basically how I got started into that. Excellent. Um, one of the things which has fascinated me about your story is the fact that you've gone on to sell over 100 million worth of real estate, but working very short period of time, which means maybe three to four days a week. So tell us about that. Yeah, that all comes really with discipline. Uh, and I know that's like such a such a basic AF answer to give somebody. So I don't I don't want to be like, by discipline, I, every, when you hear the word discipline, a lot of people, they cringe and they go, oh no, you know, I don't want to do that. But discipline isn't really, isn't what, isn't like, it just has the wrong image. A lot of people think of it like a couple of those, I forget what the guy's name is. Uh, the guy who just basically, he's like super, super intense all the time. And, and he's just like super rigid with his schedule and things like that. But that rigidity with your schedule is actually what gives you the freedom to be whatever you want to do. So for me, I'm not like this crazy neurotic guy who takes ice cold showers and then goes for a two and a half mile swim in the polar Arctic and then comes back and, you know, does my day. Like, that's not how I am. I'm more like, let me create my morning routine uh, and do that same morning routine every day. And then I have to have a certain set of tasks every day that need to be that need to get done. When those tasks get done, 
uh, repeatedly every day, they allow you to have freedom at the end of the week. So by Thursday, you know, Friday, you don't have to do as much. If you, if you win a mentor of mine taught me, he said, win the day. And you'll, um, if you win the day, if you win four days out of seven, you win the week. If you win, I forget what it is. If you win like three weeks out of four of the month, you win the month. And if you win eight months out of the 12, you win the year. So you don't have to win every day. You have to win like just like a little bit more than 50% of the week, every week. So basically I just won the day four out of seven days a week. And that basically added up to two to three or what is it? One, I think it was like around one to two months off a year on average. So I was just doing whatever I wanted, which was cool. It's awesome. It's like, it's a cool thing to do. So I think the discipline part of it is just, don't think of it as discipline. Think of it as a routine. Think of having a set number of tasks to do every day and get those tasks done and make sure those are money-making activities, not, not like going to the, to the grocery store. That's not a money, that's not a money-making activity. So it has to be high value activities rinsed and repeated every day for four to five days a week. Got it. And I want to dig a little deeper and add some value to people out there, right? So two things. Uh, one, you said about your morning routine, which I'm very interested to learn more about because I know you wake up at 3.45 a.m. Uh, that gives you a head start, obviously. Yes. Um, that's one of the things I want to know. The other thing I want to know is that, <clears throat> excuse me, about actually giving advice to people who are real estate agents right now, because you were in that sure. space for a long time, you were very successful. So what are some of the things that they can do in order to become successful, more efficient? Yeah, sure. So um, the morning routine, we'll start with that. Um, a lot of people hear that I wake up at 3.45 in the morning and they go, oh my God, that's insane. Are you crazy? What time do you go to bed? Like, And it's like, I do sleep guys. Like I go to bed at, at nine. And if you do the math, 9 p.m. to 3.45 is just short, like 15 minutes short of seven hours of sleep, which doesn't, you know, when you put it that way, it's like, oh, you know, that's really not so crazy. So it's like seven hours of sleep, guys. A lot of people, you can, you can, you can make a living on seven hours of sleep. You can't make a living on four or five hours of sleep. You, that, will, that will grind you into dust. Um, but like, if you can get seven to eight hours of sleep, I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger has the best quote on this. Uh, he always said, sleep six hours a day instead of eight. Uh, and he said, oh, you know, people say, I'm supposed to do eight hours of sleep. And Arnold would say, well, learn to sleep faster. <laughs> I thought that was like the best quote about it, about sleep. Because I think that's great. Because like, if you spend a third of your life sleeping eight hours a day, there's a lot of life you don't get to experience. And I think if you can learn to function on six or seven hours of sleep, I think that really helps. Um and there are some people who are like, I need my sleep. And it's like, okay, that's great. But think about it this way. I'm up at 345. I'm at the gym by four. I'm done by five. Now I have 5 a.m. to 8 a.m., three hours of undisturbed time, virtually undisturbed time. And people are like, oh, you don't have kids. I'm like, well, I do now. I have two kids now. And I know that uh, they don't wake up at those times. Maybe the newborn does. He, you know, But here's the thing about the newborn waking up at you know, four in the morning. He's not waking me up. I'm waking him up. <laughs> so it's like, it's not something, you, it's not going to get in your way. You know, you give the kid a bottle, he goes right back to sleep and then you get, and you continue with your workout or whatever it is. So you can throw any excuse at me in the world and I would, I would, I could tear it up um, with a morning routine like this. So, but you, so you're still going to get, think about it this way. By the time you show up at the office, like some people wake up at six, they go to the gym they're done and they get home. They go to the gym for an hour. They're back home by seven fifteen ish. They get a shower, get to the to the, the office. By the time they're at the office at eight a.m., I have already been working for three hours and, and got a workout in. So it's like that's three hour difference per day times a week. That's five days a week. That's fifteen hours more per week that I've already beat you to. So that and then yeah, you know, I multiply that by whatever how many years, how many mo- weeks in a year, fifty two. So. There's there's an insane um, extra amount of work that's done per. You could essentially do a whole. You could do two more days of work by uh, by working three hours earlier in the morning. Now you're probably thinking like, why? You know, what are you doing at that time? Like, 
nobody's awake at that time. That's fine. Re, you, I pre-write all of my emails, all of my follow-ups, all of my text messages, and I schedule everything to be sent at 8 or 8.15 in the morning. So nobody thinks that I'm like, obviously, I'm not going to text somebody. Hey, how's the, th-? you know, what I was doing is I, I wouldn't go text somebody at 4.30 in the morning and be like, hey, so uh, just wanted to follow up with you about the house. Are you still looking to sell it? Like, I would never text somebody that at 4.30 in the morning or 5. I just pre-write the text. And then when 8.15 or 8, 8 a.m. or 8.15 hit, I would just hit send. And then, and they would show up. So you'd have like 30 messages go all out at, you know, 8, 8, 15. And you spend the hour, the hour 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. like prospecting. By the time 9 a.m. Sh- showed up, you were pretty much done the day. You could basically go out and now show all the homes that you had on the schedule for that day and not have to worry about all the administrative follow-up and mother crap you've got going on. Uh, you know, you're free to do those things because of all the other stuff is already done before you even walked out the door, before your competition even showed up. I think there's a second part to that question. I forget what it was. What were we talking about? Uh, What advice for real estate agents? Yeah, advice for uh, new realtors or people uh, who are real estate agents but are stuck, not doing well. Yeah. Uh, Brian Buffini is a good um, real estate coach who taught me that he said that if if, if you show me your calendar, I can show you your income. So basically your activities have to be uh, high value money making activities. And so if you're a new agent or you're a struggling agent, you, I would do, I would advise that you focus on, um, building yourself a schedule because you, uh, the thing with real estate that's so attractive is that it has an, a never ending ceiling of income. Like you could always, there's no ceiling on the income, but then the people forget that there's no floor either. Like you can, the floor can bottom out and you can lose. And 87% of real estate agents drop out in their first year because they don't have the discipline. They don't have the routine. Like you don't have to go crazy. Just build yourself a routine. I want to, and then build yourself a set of goals and then work back from that. Be Okay. So if you want to make $200,000 a year in real estate this year, okay. What's your average sale price? How many homes do you have to sell? Okay, great. Now out of the number of homes you have to sell, how many contacts is it until you get one sale? Okay. That means you have to make X amount of contacts per day to get to one sale. So then basically you just, it's a math equation. And again, this is where the numbers guy in me comes out. And it's like, if you just hit a certain number of contacts per day, it doesn't have to be crazy, you know, constant, constant contact of like cold prospecting. Because I don't really like to do that myself. I actually never cold called in my life. Uh, what I did is I I did... Um, I did referral marketing where I focused on the the people in my database, uh, client or not, who were most likely to refer me. And working with people or, or even calling people who know me, like me, and trust me were were people that it was easier to make those phone calls and it was easier to get their trust because they already knew me anyway. Uh, and me, me being more of an introverted type, I think... Uh, what I, what I needed a better reason to, I needed a reason to call people. Cause I didn't want to get on the phone and just be like, so, Hey, um, do you know anyone looking to sell a house or buy a house? Like, you know, I didn't want to be salesy like that. So what I did was I sent people gifts ahead of time. And then I would call behind the gift and it was such an easy icebreaker and be like, Hey, just so you know, um, I sent you a gift in the mail. I just wanted to call to check in and make sure you got it. I want to show you some appreciation for, you know, for being in my life. Thank you so much for, uh, everything that you've done for me or whatever the heck, whatever it was. And people are like, Oh my God, yes, Steve, this is so nice. I really, really appreciate the, the cutting board or the scissors or the, um, whatever the speaker system or whatever it was that I sent people. Um, and they were like, um, so, so doing that, it was just easier to make those phone calls. It, it wasn't like, it wasn't salesy. Cause then what, what'll happen is like, it generates a conversation and people start it. And then inevitably every time without fail, and without having to say anything, people would ask, Steve, how's the real estate market? Now, all of a sudden, you can do your real estate stuff. Oh, it's really good. We've got a lot of things going on. What's going on with you? Are you jumping in soon? I know, I, I know you're, since you're asking, is there a reason? Are you, how come you're asking? Are you jumping in? And then they're like, yeah, that's, yeah, I was thinking about it. I got this house. I got to sell first before I got to buy this other one. And it's like, oh, cool. That's two sales for, from you, not just one. So you get people, it's more of an organic conversation rather than like, Kind of a sleazy sales pitch. One of the keys as well is the art of negotiation. So obviously in your career, so many deals, this is a skill which you have to use like 
so many uh, times, right? And obviously you still do it on an ongoing basis. So tell us about your style of negotiation. Uh, so mine is more along the lines of like, a. Um, I would guess I, I'm, I'm pretty, um, I don't know how a word for it. Secret. I'm like a secret negotiator. Like I'm negotiating with you and you don't even know I'm negotiating with you. So like, that's my whole path is like my whole thing was, um, I always called it the Fisher price method because, <laughs> because basically a lot of people, uh, in real estate, especially, uh, listing agents and people, they, they want to be in control of the of the situation there's a lot of small business owners who like a ton of control who um who want to control the whole situation from a to b and they want all of it and i can identify that because i'm one of those people i like to be in control now the whole thing is when they're driving their their they're quote unquote driving their car so they're in control what i would do is, to give you a, a picture of it is i would basically move them to the passenger seat of the car and give them a Fisher price wheel to make them think they are still in control of the conversation. So they're driving, but they're playing with Fisher price. I'm the one who's got the real wheel with the real pedals underneath the car. And that, that's how we do it. So basically I could get information out of people without them knowing I even got the information. Excellent. And, um, that's a very good way of thinking about it. Um, presently you run a company called appreciation advocate. So tell us a bit about that. Uh, yeah, so that actually came from real estate. Actually, uh, I was looking for a company to help me because I got a, a, I ended up having a big database after a while. I have a over two hundred a I have over like two hundred twenty five a plus clients that I want to work with. So to gift all of them at the same time, it took up a ton of time. So what I I started doing is I started looking for companies who could do my gifting for me that also wouldn't break my bank account. Um, and it just wasn't possible. Like every company I called, it was like, you know, some of these gifting companies were like fifteen, twenty thousand, twenty five thousand dollars just to talk to them. Like I didn't even buy a gift yet. Like I that was just a consulting fee. And I was like, well, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> and most small business owners are not gonna pay that uh just for the consulting. They're you know, th that doesn't even include the gift. So I, I you know, after you buy gifts for people, now we're looking at like, you know, somewhere of another ten or 50,000, depending on what your budget is. So you're now looking at like a $75,000 expense. It's like, that, that's never happening for small businesses, <laughs> for most small businesses. But, but a lot of small businesses will spend, you know, anywhere from three to 10 or 12 on their business. That's an easier expense. Uh, so I was like, what can I do to help my, I basically, I ran into that problem and other real estate agents were like, what can I do to do gifting? And everybody always said it. They don't have time. They don't have more time. They don't, they, they, it's too much. They're not, they're not, they're not good at it. So basically that's where I came up with it. The appreciation advocate, because I, I wanted to basically give real estate agent and, and, and any business actually at this point, um, it was, it was inspired by real estate, but it's really for all small businesses. Anybody who's trying to, who doesn't have the time, who's not good at gift giving, who can't wrap a gift to save their life, um, and who doesn't have a crazy massive budget, uh, like $75,000, that's basically what you can do is, is you just come to us and we do, we handle that for you. And we, make, and we get you more referrals, uh, in the process. That's what we, our whole goal is to get you more referrals. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds like a great business idea. Yes. Now, uh, one of the last things that I want to know from you, and this is across all industries, people starting their small business. Um, we've got a lot of solopreneurs in the market these days, you know, self-employed individuals, um, again, small businesses. So the thing is that for someone starting out in a very competitive market, in general, what can you advise them? Uh, so... I, this is not meant to plug the appreciation advocate at all, uh, but I would start with gift giving. Um, so uh, the gift giving is going to set you apart because one, that's something nobody does. So like if somebody, what everybody's used to, if you're, is like being cold called, they're used to getting stuff in the mail, like, like letters and, and um, you know, direct mail to advertising. They're used to uh, door knockers and they're used to all of that gener gener general stuff. But if you start, Want you know take a well, I don't even know who said the quote, but I, it was like the road on the extra mile is a lot less crowded. 
So go the extra mile, send somebody a gift in the mail and then follow it up with a call. And don't just be like a generic gift. Like, like we have, I would say, uh, guidelines for what, you know, we have six things that all great gifts have is a a certain set of criteria. You know, you follow those six criteria and give gifts according to that and then follow the phone call. Those are going to be easier phone calls. So if you are struggling, go the extra mile and it doesn't have to be a gift. Like if you're a car dealership, then maybe don't give gifts, but do something extra with your service. Like maybe every car that you service that comes in for servicing, vacuum the car out for them. So that way when they get the car back, it's clean. Like they're going to write home about that. That's not much. It doesn't cost much, but just vacuum it and just feel like and clean it up or fill up the gas tank every 10th car you do. I know that can be a little bit more expensive depending on what the budget is, but anything you can do to be over and above, like for real estate, well, some, th- some, I've seen some agents too was, you know, they had the door, uh, wrapped with a ribbon just to kind of make it look like a, pre- like the house was a present. And I thought that was super cool. And I, it's a great idea. Uh, it sure beats the bet, the stereotypical bottle of champagne that makes only one impression and then is gone forever. But, uh, like any kind of long-term impression you can make on think to, to the kind of thing that you want to live in this person's home and in their conscious mind 365 days a year. So what can you do to do that? Um, and that's what, that's what the, the best gifts I would say to break the ice and stay in their mind, top of mind going forward. That's what I would tell you. That's what I would do. Excellent. Steve, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate that. Uh, before we go, uh, if people wanted to find you, where would they look? Uh, if basically just send me, I would say the, the best and easiest way is just to send me an email. You can ask me whatever the heck you want, whether it's real estate or even, uh, uh, about appreciation advocate, just send me an email to Steve at appreciation and, uh, we'd be more than happy to help you out. Excellent. And we will put that in the description below. So definitely reach out to Steve if you want to start a conversation. Uh, Again, Steve, thank you so much for your time today. And I wish you all the best for this year. No, thanks, Derek. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. 